revascularization, bone turnover, and volumetric stability are some of the factors to consider when choosing a biomaterial for a clinical indication. Professor Edgar Elshar from the United States is my guest in this episode of Strawman Open Mic, and he will clarify what is fiction, what is reality, and the key benefits when using allografts in daily practice. Stay with me on this one. I'm Dr. Christian Jerry, and you're watching Strawman Open Mic. Professor Lashar, thank you very much for coming to Switzerland to discuss this very interesting and important topic that is the use of allograft in daily practice. We're real honored to have you here and welcome to Stroman Open Mic. Thank you, Christian, for uh, Dr. Jerry, for having me here. Uh, I've been following your open mic for some time. I, I love it. And uh, you inspired me to do my podcast because it was so uh, nice and to the point. And I think it's, uh, there's a lot of space for these things. So thank you for having me. Oh, my God, that means a lot to me. Thanks uh, for sharing yeah, that. Yeah, no, it's, uh, it's really, it's been a, it's actually, I enjoy it when I do it because I saw how much you were enjoying it when you do it. And I, uh, that's what makes me watch the open mic is your enthusiasm in it. It <laughs> comes genuine, it comes natural, and it helps us a lot as clinicians. So really, it's wonderful. We do have a lot of fun doing, I can yeah, tell you. Yeah, yeah. And thanks to the whole team preparing the setup yes, as well. Yes, indeed. You're right. Absolutely. The topic today is allograft. And an interesting fact is that implant dentistry has gone through several phases and done several loops, not only the phases. And we all have lived through the claim that autogenous is the gold standard. However, in a parallel lane, we also live a very interesting and important moment with the high quality of biomaterials. And there is so much in history patients have been spared from morbidity by the need of a second donor site, a second surgical site to harvest that bone. And you actually have a paper challenging exactly this status quo about the gold, the gold standard. Could you please share some of the topics about that, uh, that report with us? Well, uh, as you mentioned, it's been, it's actually, it's been my journey because when I start training uh, early 90s, I started in 1993 and I finished in 97. At that time, we had no other option other than the autogenous, because the, we had the DFDBA, and people will remember the famous paper of Becker in 1993. He said that if you graft the socket with DFDBA, actually you impede the healing of the socket. So it's criminal to do that. And we stopped grafting, and we waited two couple of months. And at that time, people forget how, when the socket healing really been studied by the late uh, colleague of mine that was a very dear friend, Dr. Cardarapoli, uh, it came out in 2003. So we didn't know how the socket heals, for instance. So uh, with time, we realized that there is a need for substitutes. There's no question about it. It is a, it's, I don't want to go dramatic and say it's a mutilation, but you're taking a piece from one place that never regenerates and to build another place. So it did never made sense in my head. Yeah. And we got the xenograft, and I was uh, still fresh out of the program uh, in the late uh, 90s. And it was a good, good uh, or we can say gut sent uh, product at that time. But was still missing something, and allograft changed. Early 2000, the technology changed. And as you mentioned before, the implant went through a lot of revolutions uh, of thinking. And we went from one diameter to multiple diameters. We went from no surface to multiple surfaces. So things do change, and technology is changing, and allograft has changed. And the question is, why aren't we espousing it? And that's why I was behind it to write this editorial, because it's a, I couldn't sit there and watch and not say anything, uh, being part of this uh, uh, atmosphere of education. So I wrote it, and the point behind it is there is an alternative, and a secure alternative, which is the allograft. And in your point of view, from your experience, what are the key advantages of allograft versus other materials? Okay. <clears throat> Again, I love your questions. They're very to the point. The most important is today we have the mineralized allograft, which we did not have before. Now, mineralized meaning they kept the, the, 
the composition of it, and it has a different uh, 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 formulas in it, meaning there's the cancellus and there's the cortical. So within one product, you are able to achieve two things. One is the early resorption that helps the new deposition, and with the cortical, which is a harder mineral, reducing the resorption to keep the volume until the bone comes in. So that's one point that was mind or game changer for me, that we were able to manipulate. And I didn't wake up one day and I said, oh my God, you know, I found it. No, it's actually in the medical uh, literature, in the trauma, they talked about it. And uh, as people need to know that in the United States, Every day, there is hundreds and thousands of allograft being placed between orthopedics and dental. So the, the need is there, the fulfillment is there, the, the abundance of it is there, and the, 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 the delivery of the product is there. So you have everything in one shot. And that's why I started moving into the allograft space and I stayed there. I like very much how you describe the journey of the allograft and based on your experience, we know there's not one size fits all in bone grafting. Uh, different uh, resorption time, revascularization, turnover, they all play a role when selecting a material for the different indications mm -hmm. like socket preservation, gap management, sinus lifting, all these different indications with different behavior of that grafting site. In your experience, what is Professor Leroshar decision matrix and making uh, when selecting the, the allograft for the different uh, situations? Well, <coughs> the fact that we have two different density of mineralization and two different sizes of each one of them, it gives the clinician the opportunity to manipulate biology to their own. So for instance, if you have a thick biotype, and now we know that it is part of the diagnosis, we have to know the phenotype. If you have a thick phenotype, meaning thick wall, thick soft tissue, you don't need to put cortical bone. You can put cancellus. Now, what's the benefit of cancellus? It holds the clot, it does resorb, and up, let the bone uh, uh, restore it. And that's one criteria. If you are in a thin biotype or phenotype, that's correct the name because the biotype has disappeared as a word, you can use both. You can use the cancellus and you use the cortical as a layer, meaning one holds the clot, one holds the, the volume change. If you go to the sinus, you know, uh, we had a study uh, when I was at NYU, unfortunately stopped, but we did the histology on multiple cases. We played with the volume of the, of the, we manipulated the volume to our advantage by using different granule size. Mm. So uh, our formula was very simple. It was 50-50, cancellus and cortical, and each one 25% big, 25% small. And with that, we manipulated the volume stability. We manipulated the resorption uh, 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 rate, and with that, we delivered beautiful result and stable result. We took CBCT immediately after the placement. I do that in my, my office all the time. And then we did it at uh, eight months. And I can assure you that the volume stayed the same. It never changed. And you have bone. That's the key. You end up with bone. So you pretty much mix them. You mm. don't apply one layer on one side, the other layer on the other side, simulating like cortical wall yeah. or, or cancellous. You mix them. It, it is true. It, I'm sorry. Uh, let me correct myself. If we are doing sockets or ridge augmentation, I layer them. I see. When it comes to the sinus, it's difficult to layer in the sinus. Mm -hmm. So I mix, I mix the mixture together and I put it and it becomes a, a one block of bone inside and it, held, it holds the volume, it opposes the bone and it turns into bone. So for different manipulation is different uh, options. Uh, for sockets, for ridge augmentation, I layer, I use the small uh, volume or uh, size of the allograft, when it comes to the sinus, I mix them together with different sizes of cortical and cancellus, and I make my mixture. So it is 50-50, but also within the 50-50, each 50 has different sizes. Mm -hmm. And that's how you can gain it, but it's all mixed together in the sinus. Thanks for sharing all your expertise. And speaking of expertise, I see that 
the US seems to have adopted allografts quite a long time ago, so the unknown factor is already put aside. While in Europe, we are moving in baby steps, but in the right direction. But why do you see this trend geographically? Why do we have in Europe so much preference for xenograft, which in a way goes back to the previous question, it's more like a one size fits all. In Europe, there has been this fear of some kind, the allograft going to create a, uh, a risk of contamination of the, uh, of the, uh, the receiver. And, and this has been proven that is wrong. I, I mean, we've never seen any problem of rejection nor of uh, contamination. Matter of fact, we know all the uh, diseases of the humans, so we, they are screened beautifully, and the processes that allow them to become a mineral, it is so accurate nowadays in different banks, and then it's so clean and so precise that it gives you a good uh, result. And you mentioned it, the beauty of the allograft, there is no one size fits all. Rather, with the xenograft, it is, you see them, one size fits all. And it's different size of sintering. Everybody has a different formula. And in reality, the sintering started for one reason, is to kill the organic material. And by killing all the organic material, you kill the resorption. And when you don't have a resorption, you will end up with having this product in you forever and ever. And that's why when you have an allograft, you impose on it inflammation, it acts like a normal bone, it resorbs. And that's exactly what you want. So the effect of the periimplantitis that happens around it, it is still more contained. And in your experience, have you ever faced any complication which you could pinpoint allograft was the cause of that complication? You know, it, it, uh, it's, I am a believer that you can never say that you never seen it uh, or, uh, or I don't get failures. No, we never had a problem that came from allograft. Now, the, did we have some, uh, some places where part of the allograft didn't take? Well, yes, but that happens with everything. Now, let me take you back for the autogenous bone because that's a very delicate point for me. When they do this uh, autogenous bone, the bone blocks or the monocortical, whatever it is, it's a dead bone. Now, you put the soft tissue on it, it breaks through it, and sometimes it gets exposed. But they don't talk about that part. Now, it gets exposed, then the, the, the result of your graft is not working anymore because that's a dead bone. It's delaying the regeneration. But how can you justify it? You took a big block and you have it exposed. And let me tell you, I have documented tons of these cases because I've done a lot of them. And anybody who tells you I don't have a failure is a, is a liar. I had had failures, obviously. Otherwise, we wouldn't be here. We wouldn't improve ourselves. But I can't justify it to have autogenous bone block poking through the soft tissue. And I know it failed. At this point, it's acting for nothing because now you get more resorption. Uh, and, 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 then, and, and then here, mentally, I have taken one piece and I resorbed it and I couldn't achieve my results. Uh, with an allograft, if it does happen, the worst come to worst is I take it out and I redo it. Uh, so it's not a big failure uh, as you see it on autogenous bone. When it comes to the synthetic bone, the more you see is bone that is not hard enough to place an implant in it versus that you see that in allograft. And there is, there's just been happening over and over. And it's not something only it happened with me, it happened with a lot. And when I used to run the program at NYU, we had one of the biggest uh, programs and we had 13,000 patients a year. So we've seen a lot of cases and we've noticed the changes and we've seen it and we documented it. And that's why I became a believer of allograft over and over. And uh, so I can't point one thing that happened because of allograft. We've never had any contamination or anybody rejecting or ending up in a hospital or having a disease transmission. So none of that has ever happened. So that's why I, I, uh, I, the numbers talk. Millions have been placed by allograft. Not one recorded a problem. So it, uh, it, it, it answers itself, yeah, so. It gives a lot of relief, huh? Mm, yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So on a positive side, now we have this sell me this pen session. Right off the bat, three reasons why clinicians should adopt allograft in their daily practice. Well, I'm one. gonna, uh, uh, one, 
you can have an abundance of it. Two, it will turn into bone. And three, which is the most important thing, which I don't have an answer for you. <laughs> <laughs> no, but in, in reality, in one, in one word, I can tell you, I want to have a product that I put it, it allows the bone to come in, and later on, I take a histology, and there's no more bone there, no more residual graft. And that's, for me, a one selling point instead of three. Sold. <laughs> 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 Professor Oshar, thank you very much for stopping by at Strauman Open Mic, for clarifying the myths, the reality, in your decision making, your decision process behind the use of allograph. This was a very insightful conversation. Thanks for coming. Christian, thank you very much for having me. And finally, to get to meet you in person. My pleasure. Uh, we've, we've been for over three years uh, meeting on Zooms and, and stuff like that. So it is a pleasure. I admire all your work. And uh, really, I love your open mic. Uh, keep doing it. <laughs> oh, get emotional. <laughs> thank you. And if you have missed Professor Leoshar lecture during the Biomaterial Symposium, I have great news for you. The lecture is available right now on demand and the link is in the description of this episode right below. Click on it, watch, enjoy and grow. I see you in the next episode of Strauman Open Mic. Ciao.